Welcome. I'm Marcia Eli, class of 80, and co-chair of the Program Committee of the Pembroke Center Advisory Council. On behalf of the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women and our co-sponsor, the Brown Women's Network, I am so happy to welcome you, alumni, students, faculty, staff, community members, everyone, to this evening's program, Perfect Storm, Women, Work, and the COVID-19 Pandemic. I wanna start by sharing that one of our panelists, Jennifer Klein, is unfortunately unable to join us this evening due to unforeseen circumstances. We will miss her and we look forward to inviting her to a future event at the Pembroke Center. The hosts of tonight's event, the Friends of the Pembroke Center and the Pembroke Center Advisory Council are alumni, parents, and others who support the work of the center. We are thrilled to play a part in advancing public conversations around gender, race, and difference through events like this one. This academic year marks the 40th anniversary of the Pembroke Center, which was founded a decade after Pembroke College, the Women's College of Brown, merged fully with the Men's College. As the greater Brown community marks 130 years of women at Brown, the Pembroke Center is delighted to celebrate its groundbreaking research on women and forms of difference and its teaching, curatorial, and community building missions. The center is home to Brown's program in gender and sexuality studies. We hold the Pembroke Center archives, which preserve and celebrate the history of Brown alumni, feminist theory, and LGBTQIA history. And with the support of the Friends of the Pembroke Center, we sponsor research grants for faculty and students, collect oral histories from Brown women, and host a wide array of events and programs. I hope you will visit the center's website to learn more and become a friend of the Pembroke Center. A few final housekeeping notes. I'd like to let you know that tonight's program is being recorded and there will be an opportunity for your questions at the end of the moderated discussion. You can submit them through the, throughout the program by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So we are so honored to welcome Alyssa Quart, tonight's moderator, and Karen Dynan and Andrea O'Neill, our panelists, for this discussion that will dig into the stark inequalities that almost two years of COVID have laid bare relating to women, labor, class, and race in this country. We are so thankful to Alyssa, Andrea, and Karen for their time, insights, and enormous expertise. Let me tell you a little bit more about each of these accomplished women and hand it off to them. Alyssa Quart, class of 94, and our moderator for this evening is the executive director of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, a journalism nonprofit. She is the author of four nonfiction books, including Squeeze, Why Our Families Can't Afford America, as well as two books of poetry. Her next book, Bootstrapped, Liberating Ourselves from the American Dream is forthcoming in 2022. Her multimedia work includes the new podcast series, Going for Broke with Ray Suarez. She has received an Emmy and a Neiman Fellowship and uh, has taught at Brown and also at Columbia School of Journalism. Alyssa concentrated in English at Brown with honors in creative writing and received an MS in journalism from Columbia. Karen Dynan, class of 85, is professor of the practice of economics in the Department of Economics and at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. She served as Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and Chief Economist at the US Department of the Treasury from 2014 to 2017, where she led analysis of economic conditions and development of policies to address the nation's economic challenges. From 2009, 2009 to, to, to 2013, Karen was vice president and co-director of the economic studies program at the Brookings Institute. Karen's concentrated in applied math and economics at Brown and received her PhD and AM in economics from Harvard. 
Andrea M. O'Neill, class of 03, has 20 years of experience championing the advancement of marginalized communities with expertise in institutional equity, racial and economic justice, organizational behavior, and cultural change management. She is a presidential appointee in the Biden-Harris administration, serving as the senior advisor to the Administrator for Equity at the US General Services Administration. Andrea has served as a committee member for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Equitable Futures Project, the Ambassadors Program for the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, and Brown's Presidential Task Force on Anti-Black Racism and President's Leadership Council. Andrea concentrated in business economics at Brown, and she is the president-elect of the Inman Page Black Alumni Council. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here. Alyssa, I hand it off to you. What a wonderful introduction, Marsha. And I'm just like swelling with pride right now to be a Brown graduate and to be back at Pembroke talking to these incredible women, Karen and Andrea, and I'm sure many in the audience as well. Uh, so thank you again, Marsha, Martha, et cetera, for organizing this event. Um, so this is a sad topic in some ways. You know, Are we as women uh, still in the midst of COVID what is our experience going to be? Are we going to be able to make up the gap that's, that, that have emerged over the last years for women? And um, that's sort of the basic question we're going to ask. And I'll just put it that bluntly. I mean, uh, can we expect to make it up in our lifetimes, Andrea? Well, it's a really complicated question. And it's one that we really need to consider, um, particularly given how disparity and uh, systemic inequities have really come to the forefront through the pandemic um, and uh, highlighted the structural inequities in our economy and our workforce um, that existed prior to the pandemic. So um, the question is, you know, how deep is the hole and how long does each individual community of women and including in that trans women and non-binary folks, how long does it take for uh, them to climb out of it? Um, we know that the effects of the pandemic were unequal and uh, the recovery will also be unequal. Um, and so the opportunity for uh, resiliency is really, um, you know, relying on um, public policy mechanisms, a co justice coalition of women across race and class to really uh, highlight and spotlight the issues that face our society and make sure that we're applying the appropriate pressure and levers to the root causes of things that are going to actually help make a recovery possible. So Karen, like, what are your thoughts? Like, you're a trained economist, like, what... <laughs> What does it look like? You know, you see these dire people love future of work. Now they're like future of misery. Uh, like every study is another. So, how do we get out of it? What uh, are we condemned? You know, these these are the questions in my mind. Um, yeah. So first of all, let me just say it's amazing to be here with such a distinguished uh, panel talking about this incredibly important issue. Um, so, so just, uh, you know, taking a step back, uh, you know, you may have heard, heard this called a, a she session in that, as Andrea was saying, women were hurt, um, hit harder, and it's not a mystery what happened. Uh, we know that the high contact services sector, leisure, hospitality, health, education, uh, was hit the hardest early in the pandemic. And, um, uh, and those those jobs tend to be disproportionately filled by by women. Um, so you know, I, I will say, you know, as time has gone on, the numbers don't um, kind of look that different for women versus men. But I think the really important point to remember is that um, we've got two million women who um, are not working now, who were working. Uh, in February 2020. Uh, and when you look at the numbers and try to figure out what's going on, it looks like um, a lot of women have just stepped out of the labor force. And we don't know exactly all the causes of that. We think it's fear of the virus. We think it's difficulty obtaining childcare. Uh, you know, maybe it's people just living off their saving because they don't want to go back to these high contact jobs, which are more. Uh, uh, 
you know, dangerous now, given what's going on in terms of the virus. But we don't really know what the future holds uh, for these women. I suspect what we're going to see is it's going to depend on where you are in terms of the kind of income distribution. I think for women higher in the income distribution, um, we certainly have seen data about um, parents uh, basically declining promotion, cutting back their hours, uh, stopping their upskilling uh, because they have these additional family responsibilities to shoulder. Um, I think the good news up higher in the wage distribution is that some of those women will benefit from um, kind of pandemic technologies that enhance their productivity and remote work. Um, but, you know, we need to see how that all comes out. I think lowering that wage distribution, I think that's, that's where we should really be worried because those women are going to benefit from pandemic technology. Right now, they're the ones who are more likely to be out of the labor force. And we just know historically being out of the labor force has resulted in lower wages over time. So we just, I think it remains to be seen, but we should be worried. I mean, that's such a great point about wage distribution. And, and it's something that we heard, you know, we heard a lot about women breaking the glass ceiling, right? This is in the olden days now, uh, girl bosses, CEOs, C-suites, this whole discourse around uh, women making these strides. And there was a, a lot of uh, leaning in, et cetera. There was a sort of uh, myopia and some of that thinking, I think, because what we're seeing now, right, is that a lot of, it's hard to, for people to even keep their jobs, uh, especially when you don't have uh, child care. There was a daycare shortage. I've, I've written about that in a piece I wrote in the Washington Post. Um, and, you know, there's, as you said, people who don't want to expose themselves to COVID and have families and they can't go back. So this is not uh, the discourse that we were given I don't know, even 10 years ago around women's liberatory work. So I, what I'm wondering is, there, is, this, is there gonna be a change in how we think about, I don't know, solidarity basically? Is, is, is that gonna be possible now if we recognize, you know, we're not gonna just like wash our faces and lean in or <laughs> what have you and, or get these like fabulous jobs that there's, and there's all these people who are really suffering and now we we have to we have to help them. I mean, is there a recognition now, Andrea, do you think? I think there's some of that and it started before COVID. I, you know, you saw this kind of um, uh, multicultural um, movement uh, among women that were trying to have a better conversation, a more thoughtful and nuanced conversation about intersectionality um, and different forms of feminism and how um, you know, uh, even what labor looks like has looked differently over the centuries for different uh, women. And so I do, uh, I'm hopeful that those, those conversations have continued. And what's really interesting is, um, you know, and something that Karen pointed out, you know, across the spectrum of uh, race, class, education, um, the entrenched uh, uh, sexism in our society and gender roles and, uh, you know, folks that uh, were at home, uh, working full-time jobs as C-suite executives and also cooking dinner and also caring for children uh, with a husband at home too. Like, you know, those, those kinds of disparities, um, you know, reveal themselves. And I think there's a new, um, you know, uh, platform for camaraderie and discussion and discourse and excavation of, you know, these, again, entrenched, um, you know, forces uh, of oppression in our society. What I do fear is that when we think about a return to normalcy, or even when we think about policy and this idea of like the New Deal, those kinds of policies left a lot of folks out the, the last time. And so, you know, we think about recovery, we think about resiliency, and not just, you know, surviving, but thriving, coming out of the pandemic, um, particularly for, uh, low wealth women, women in rural areas, uh, you know, um, women of color, some of those old, you know, monsters are still in the closet. The question is, uh, how do they reshape themselves and evolve with our new technology economy and on Zoom and all of these new skills um, that can leave completely new segments of uh, women and out of the marketplace, out of the workforce, um, you know, leave them underskilled, um, even with college degrees in some cases. Um, and, and particularly, we know that there is that gender tax uh, when it comes to gaps on our resume and our ability to compete successfully for a constricting labor market. Um, so I, I do want, I worry about that. 
Um, and again, I, I believe, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And so I love, you know, that we continue to talk about these things and we need to find broad coalition for support and public pressure. Yeah, no, I love that, the, the gender tax. I'll just, um, so, so Karen, like, so your thoughts on this too, like, is, are there, I mean, I guess one of the question I have, are there actual things that can be done to bring women together around this issue so that we're not siloed, you know, one person with their husband at home, as you were saying, Andrea, uh, say, you know, completely distinct from the single mom who's trying to do everything for a child and can't hold on to their job or doesn't want to because they'll put their the only thing they love at risk, you know, like how do we bring people together to see each other more clearly? I mean, that's not really a technical economic question, <laughs> um, but I mean, are there ways that the numbers can help us do that too, do you think? I think so. I mean, I feel like, um... So there are common problems that kind of women across the, the board are facing. So, um, and then there are also problems that just, you know, wherever you are in the income distribution, uh, you know, they've, they've been a problem forever, but um, wherever you are, you're feeling it in one way or another, even if it's not directly affecting you, it's indirectly affecting you. But childcare, <laughs> uh, that's just such a, big issue right now. So uh, the, I, th I think early in the pandemic, I think it was something like, you know, childcare jobs shrank by a third. And that's because uh, people were being um, kind of laid off. But, but now the problem is that there's this short, women want to return to work, but there is this shortage of uh, childcare workers. We're down about, still about, um, I think 10, 15% from uh, you know, where we were pre-pandemic. And it is, has become this frustrating chicken and the egg problem in terms of uh, you know, women returning to work. But I think it is um, leading to a focus on what is, what is wrong with this sector. And I, I think we have known for a while that uh, wages, you know, these are you know, some of the lowest paying jobs in our society. And um, kind of wages are just low and it's hard to attract people into this field. And I think it is causing a um, conversation about how are we going to fix this problem to get, and I think it's going to involve higher wages. I think it's going to involve also career ladders because I think that is the other problem with childcare. But I think in other sectors as well, uh, even if you're not directly affected, so an ex you are indirectly affected. So an example would be, um, Healthcare, where again, you know, a lot of females in those jobs, um, you know, it's another sector where um, a lot of people who were in the labor force are sitting out. We don't know entirely well why, but again, I suspect it has to do with fear of getting the virus or bringing the virus home to um, more vulnerable relatives. Um, maybe also those jobs just weren't that great to start with, but I think. You know, even if you're not directly affected because you're not a worker in those sectors, you are being affected by the fact that you can't get the health care that you need and your family can't get your health, the health care needs. So I'm hoping that we will see kind of uh, more of a, you know, people coalesce, coalescing around these uh, issues and, and realizing there's a need for change. Yeah. Alyssa, can I add to that? Um, this, I, I, Karen um, sparked something. This idea of you know gendered roles and the value of certain uh, or the utility of certain types of positions that you know were considered to be more women and female oriented, all of a sudden thrust into this um, lack of a better word, kind of public service as essential workforces. Um, and I'll add teachers to that mix too. I think, you know, all the parents are probably much more appreciative of the, the, the heavy lift that teachers do and, uh, you know, home health aides and, and all the folks that are kind of the backbone of our, uh, the social infrastructure that were largely unseen, mostly, um, you know, dealing with, uh, forces that you know cr created trauma and violence and all kinds of things in their lives, um, um, uh, you know, as they intersect with capitalism, and now all of a sudden, kind of being um, put into this uh, limelight where we're celebrating them for their sacrifice um, and sometimes with their with their lives and their mental health and their their family, um, you know, quality of life, um, but with no additional ancillary support protection recovery time, pay, 
Um, and so again, when we shift back to normalcy, what does that mean that those folks go back to the shadows without um, any of the um, national kind of recognition and care and attention they need to, to recover from being part of our frontline workforce? Yeah, I think that's that's true. And I think, in fact, some people may resent some of those workers. I mean, they're they're unbelievably like I, I know you, you said, oh, teachers, but I think that there's, you know, they obviously uh, there's a sector of our population that's obsessed with not wearing masks in schools and, you know, stoking actually battles with teachers. So I think it's complicated, right? Like one would like to think that 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 the effort created sympathy, but I think sometimes uh, dependence creates resentment <laughs> in certain sectors of population, you know, societal dependence, like, oh, I actually need these people and I'm not getting exactly what I need because of this disease and now I'm gonna be really angry. Mm -hmm. So I wonder that's, I feel like that could be a dangerous factor that we have to deal with that's on the horizon. Um, so my question too with this is, is, and this isn't really a political, I mean, this is not a vote, voting kind of politics question. It's more of an activism. I mean, is there in Sweden and in other countries in the 60s and 70s, women organized and they organized around childcare and that led to uh, a great, greater number, far greater number being able to join the workforce. Um, and it was sort of a mother's or a parent's movement. And I've also often thought about this, like, could there be a parent's revolution? What's holding us back? Um, and I wonder what you think of that. I mean, and I guess the same could be said for healthcare. Is there a way to, for, for people to be better organized around some of these, these issues? And I think part of the problem is, of course, if you're a parent, you're bone tired and you're not you know, your kids keeping you up at night uh, and they, you know, they need their lunch made. I'm thinking about my own life here and you're not going to be doing this extra job of organizing, but what could we do to make it more possible? You know, it's a broad question. Andrea, do you, do you have thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I, so I think it is actually like, you know, it's evidence-based research that kind of highlights these disparities. So like the work that Karen is doing every day, the work that you're doing to, you know, lift up these important topics in, um, in, in media, um, you know, making sure that we, um, you know, spotlight where, uh, where the, there are these disparities and where we rank kind of relative to other nations on these issues. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, public discourse recently about um, paid family leave, um, you know, in the, in the rest of the developed world and how America um, doesn't have that as kind of a national policy. Um, and so what might that do over time? And there's debate about how to pay for it, how long it's gonna take, is it actually an ancillary benefit or a right? You know, all of those kinds of um, uh, partisan issues that get, um, uh, um, you know, teased out, but, um, you think about, you know, what, what it actually takes to, to, to raise a family, what people need to live uh, on relative to, you know, inflation, et cetera. Um, what is the, again, kind of you know, quality of life and ability to uh, generate enough energy to, to uh, push forward the next generation? And, and, uh, and all of those things are, you know, both philosophical and also very, very real and practical as part of our policy fabric, as part of our national identity, as part of our value system. Um, and the things that we coalesce around um, as Americans um, wanting to, uh, you know, live up to uh, its ideals and promises. Can I jump in here? So I was going to go with the evidence-based research too. <laughs> I felt like I would be like talking my own book. So I'm delighted, Andrea, I brought it up. But I do think- you love this aggregated data, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I do think educating um, people, I mean, so we, we've had this, um, body of evidence, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, really solid, rigorous evidence, and it's been something that the economics uh, profession has been generating for maybe the last 12, 15 years, but it's been really a, a, a revolution. Um, I mean, I think we all, or many of us have the sense that um, by, um, uh, you know, having such 
uh, such such large disparities in, in incomes across groups and such large disparities in opportunity, that that's very bad for the social fabric. And I think we all, or many of us have that sense that that alone is damaging. But what this research shows is um, it's documenting concretely the benefits really to everyone um, from um, kind of addressing you know, these disparities in our society. So this, this research documents that things like high quality preschool, um, you know, adequate healthcare, uh, you know, food security, uh, housing security, um, that these things not only relieve hardship in the moment, that they are um, something that really benefits uh, you know, poor kids kind of way down the road. I mean, you see it, um, you know, if you, if you spend money on a, a poor child or a poor child's family when they're young, uh, you know, when they are adults, you know, we've documented that they're more likely to be in the labor force, that they're more likely to get education, that they're more likely to earn higher wages, that they're less likely to be engaged with the criminal justice system. So those things, that's good for everyone. I mean, it's obviously good for individual economic mobility, but that's going to pay off for society more broadly. First of all, because it will improve, I think, the social fabric. But on top of that, you know, it means you know more more tax revenue coming into the system. Uh, it means a, a you know a, a higher uh, standard in, of living in the country as a whole. So um, so so I think. So I, I don't want to sound like the typical economist that the answer to everything is research, but I do yeah. feel like helping people um, kind of understand uh, the the payoff is a, is an important complement to um, the other political forces that are creating an opportunity right now. Yeah, and you know I wanted to just add you know we think about these issues like equal pay, um, and I, I think there's um a link that we can share out with the audience, but Forbes, you know, highlighted that as an example, um, based on 2020 um, earnings data, Black women still have to work an extra 214 days uh, to gain parity with non-Hispanic white male um, earning levels, right? And so when we think about this, you know, equal pay for equal work conversation, the data um, and how we disaggregate and how we talk about it is disaggregated um, based on intersectionality and experience is, is critically important uh, to us actually, you know, um, focusing efforts on, again, kind of mitigating the worst of the disparities as we rebuild, um, as we target root causes for some of our most entrenched and structural inequities um, at the intersections of race and gender and class. Um, you know, those things are important to, to highlight. Um, and then the other um, maybe point I'll make is, is we think about, you know, the type of economy we want to live in. And as we have these new emerging, again, uh, workforces and types of technologies that are going to govern probably the next 100 years, um, you know, what do we, who's in those labor forces? Um, how are we upskilling for the future? Um, are we going to be having the same conversation about what we thought were the, the top professional service jobs, like we were talking about coal miners, you know, 10 years ago, right? So um, they're, they're real concerns. And, and obviously, at the margins and in the, um, in the intersections, uh, those folks are most vulnerable to the most, you know, downstream impacts when the economy shifts. And there's tectonic kind of um, relationship with the economy and, and our workforce. I think, I think Andrea's uh, making an, an excellent point to be forward looking at this. I mean, this is, this is my big, when people ask me as an economist, what's my biggest worry? It's that the pandemic is accelerating uh, the trend we've already seen, which is technology is just benefiting, uh, you know, those people who are in, you know, the knowledge economy, uh, including ourselves. Uh, and it's really not, uh, it has not benefited those who are, uh, now, I mean, once upon a time, they were in uh, manufacturing jobs often, but, you know, those, the, those jobs have, you know, greatly diminished in the last few decades, and now they're in service sector jobs. Um, so, so I do think part of that, you know, just in terms of that kind of longer term solution is going to be finding ways to um, upskill people. Uh, whether it's through, uh, you know, um, you, more access to um, certain forms of higher education or just 
kind of better training and other things that we can do for people. Mm -hmm. I think also one thing I saw when I was working at my last book, Squeezed, was uh, that a lot of the programs that are training programs are not free, that they, that people take on educational debt, they take on uh, apprenticeship programs, certificate programs, some of them are for profit. And, and so, I mean, that's something I was wondering, I mean, now we're discussing college debt, right, and the end of the moratorium around that. Um, I mean, are there skills training programs or a way of funding them or organizing them and creating infrastructure for them for female workers that you guys like? I mean, is there um, something that people should be uh, pushing for in terms of that? Because I think that's, uh, I mean, obviously part of this is debt forgiveness uh, of some degree, right? For the debt that people already have accrued trying to better their lives. But uh, is there something for the future? Karen, Andrea, either yeah. one. So I, I, I worked on, um, actually, I worked on student loan debt when I was at the Treasury Department. It's a really important issue. Um, and you're, you're entirely right. I mean, there are, there's a whole kind of, you know, so, you know, the first thing we were always supposed to say, and it's something I really believe is the student loan program is a good program that works out well for many people who otherwise wouldn't be able to get that education. And they do get a payoff, but there's this whole group of people who, basically um, racked up a lot of student debt, uh, uh, getting education or kind of partial college education that just didn't pay off at all. And so they're in this terrible situation now. So that, that's the whole conversation around debt uh, forgiveness. But you know, first answer is you know, we should do more grants. I mean, why do we even feel like everything has to be a loan? I think it was this sense that, well, loans get paid back, so it's better for the taxpayer. Well. If the loans aren't being paid at back because people are defaulting on their loans because they can't pay them because they didn't get a valuable education, then you probably just should have given a grant in the first place. Um, but I do think, um, you know, there, there are a lot of interesting conversations around um, community college, uh, which I agree it's, it's not free, but with um, grants for low income students, it's not nearly as expensive as some other forms of higher education, but it has to come, I think, community college and I think also just training. Um, it's partly about uh, teaching the people the skills and it's partly about kind of the wraparound uh, services. It's, it's the everything from incentivizing students to complete their education, because if you get a a partial degree, it really is not going to pay off in terms of the job you get. Um, to you know, helping people connect with employers, helping people who you know maybe come from a family where they kind of never learn this. You know, how, you know, how is it that you go in for a, a job interview? Uh, you know, what is it? You know, what 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 should you be expecting out of your job? So I, I think there's a kind of just a whole bunch of work to be done there. Um, yeah, and um, as mentioned in my bio, I spent most of my adult life thinking about these things. Um, and as a former former banker, you know, mea culpa, I came into Brown's a chemical engineer, left as a banker. So I'm not sure what that says about me or Brown at that point. But I kind of combined my 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 powers to think about these things again at the intersections. Um, and you know, um, I think we can we can train a new labor force, but it's really going to take. Um, you know, the employers, the power of the employers, the private sector, um, thinking about the, you know, spectrum of employment options differently um, and making sure that, um, you know, in our power for profit, we're also thinking about, you know, um, the, how we might be contributing uh, to the inequities. And, and, and again, as um, you know, someone that's kind of worked in the investment space, I like this idea of, um, you know, corporations, in shareholders and different stakeholders in the uh, in the financial markets, uh, talking about these issues more um, meaningfully um, and making um, you know policy changes that can help um, at least diversify boardrooms and those kinds of um, positioning to perhaps affect uh, corporate behavior in these ways. Uh, working with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on the Equitable Futures Project. Um, you know, one of the things we were looking at is structural under and unemployment for low income and, um, and youth of color and what are their pathways, you know, what kinds of messaging are they getting about what their options are, uh, even for middle school, um, what kind of signaling about 
the jobs that are available in their communities. Uh, we think about going to you know college, even when we uh, look at you know hold, holding um, all of the other factors constant. Um, you know, black people with um, advanced degrees um, as a on um, a median you know net worth um, still are, are have less net worth than um, uh, the you know, median uh, white household with just a high school diploma, right? And so we're thinking about these compounding um, wealth inequities in our system. Um, you know, Citigroup did a study last year that looked at um, the institutional cost of racism in our banking system. And it was, you know, $16.2 trillion of lost GDP. So to the point that we, um, you know, may not directly feel the effects of these things. They drag down our entire um, system. Um, they drag down the potential of generations of people. Um, and that only compounds when we think about intersections of, of, of gender and race and, and class. Um, and so I think it's, it's critically important um, that we, you know, as an example, we think about um, things related to the financial markets or, um, you know, the pandemic was was great for a lot of reasons for certain sectors of our, our society. We got to sit at home. We got to think about our hierarchy of needs and maybe that trended towards self-actualization and leaning in and starting a business and, you know, leveraging our um, saved up capital for more investments in the markets that gave us a little bit of cushion and safety to quit that job that we didn't like, <laughs> right? Uh, knowing that we could monetize it later. Um, but others um, were displaced from their housing um, and their unemployment benefits have run out um, and the stay on evictions have run out. Um, and so what does that do? Like we, we all know here and probably on the line, you know, these, these cycles of poverty, it's expensive to be poor, right? It's expensive um, when you maybe are unbanked or underbanked, um, don't have savings. Um, there's, you know, wide statistics about the percentages of Americans that can't afford a $400 hit, um, you know, unexpected emergency. So I think, you know, going back to your first question, Alyssa, like how we think about this as a recovery um, and what kind of America we want to live in on the on the end of this pandemic, and and you know the second wave of the pandemic, we may be out of the virus stage of it, but you know the mental health part of it, the um, you know economic structural changes that we're going to experiencing. Um, uh, Dr. Ja has talked a lot about this, and I love what he's doing over the School of Public Health to look at these kinds of you know public health issues. Um, you know he's he said that we're not gonna be out of this for a while. <laughs> um, and I think we need to take that to heart even when we're past the, um, you know, the, the medical emergency that it is. Yeah, um, so I have uh, like one and a half more questions and then we're gonna move on to our audience. Um, so, I mean, what would you tell a female uh, brown grad now? Uh, looking at this labor market, I mean, now I know that's a really different set of um, concerns than what we're talking about with community colleges, which by the way, I'm thinking you need childcare, you need set housing. I mean, when you think about the community college, that a lot of those infrastructural things are left out of that equation. So, I mean, I know people who try to go to community college and they can't because they don't have, they're living at home, you know, and there's, there's no room for them to do schoolwork. But, but like for the Brown grad who may be, uh, maybe not our most pressing concern, but still, you know, she's a young woman. What, what, what are we telling her to think of in this moment in terms of job creation and, and possibility and professional planning? I mean, do you guys have any thoughts? That... Are we supposed to deliver a happy message? No, it could be <laughs> grit, gritty. I mean, um... I mean, it's just the pandemic has just been a setback in so many different ways. And I, it's just, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I um, graduated before uh, any of you did. And I, you know, I think at the time um, as a woman, I knew there would be um, challenges uh, to, to, to achieving everything I wanted to achieve during my career and in terms of my family. And I knew it would be a real balancing act. And, um, but I always felt like, well, but it'll be better for future generations. And I think the unfortunate thing about the pandemic is that it really is a, a setback. It really, you know, the balancing act is just, um, 
kind of at least for the last you know 21 months has been kind of as hard as it's been in decades and um i think it really has revealed um kind of the the vulnerabilities of um even even if you are someone who's going to go into the knowledge economy and you're going to get uh you know a job that has has high wages um I just think, you know, that's, it's not, you can't just take it for granted <laughs> that it's going to be easy from, from there. And I think that's, what's been um, highlighted, but I, you know, I hope, um, you know, I, I hope that uh, college graduates of today, you know, one of the message messages that they come out with is that, you know, we just, we need a, a better safety net that it's, it's really not, you know, there are always going to be people who are, uh, you know, hurt in these episodes, but it, but it's really about everyone, and it really is hurting all of us, and it's hurting our social fabric in a way that's coming back to kind of really affect everything about our lives. And so, uh, you know, just because you know you're going to get a job where you get paid leave uh, doesn't mean that you know you want to live in a country where you know other people are going to have to take jobs that don't have those benefits, and so on. I that's a that's a grim yet optimistic <laughs> yet idealistically good, for that. <laughs> grim answer. Um, what do you what do you think Andrea I, I I love Brown number one it's like ever true for me I'm back whenever I can be on College Hill um, pandemic willing um, and I'll just say that you know in a changing um, chaotic world Brown I believe has uniquely prepared um, it's, it's students and alumni for success, regardless of kind of what's getting thrown at us. It's a very interdisciplinary um, learning environment with a lot of self-agency built in and the um, level of um, connectedness to the, the world, to the future, um, the ability to kind of just co-create um, a learning agenda um, and actually make, make real impact in the world, I think is something that's really special. Um, please play this clip for President Paxson. <laughs> that's my, my <laughs> marketing plug. Um, and, you know, my mother is on the line. Uh, you know, she was very proud to put P03 behind her name. Um, and I just, um, I, I can't say enough about what, you know, my Brown education did for me. Um, and, the, and, the, and the think about kind of approaching these problems head on with vigor and with rigor um, and with optimism, because I think that's kind of what we need, um, especially um, when it's really, really easy to be pessimistic uh, about the future. Um, and, you know, I'll say this to anyone, you know, listening that's a, a current student, there's so many resources um, to leverage, um, you know, both at Brown and the support network and the alumni community. Um, and, you know, kind of betting on yourself that you can shift through some of the changes. Um, you know, again, I, I talked about um, being a chemical engineer coming in and went to, um, uh, you know, investment banking for my early years, um, financial crisis allowed me to, you know, take that gap year I've been hoping to take. Um, and I actually had time to be very creative as Brown students do, right? I, I lived in London for four years. I, you know, DJed in Switzerland briefly. I wrote a play that, or re reinvigorated play that I wrote my senior year of Brown, right? Um, and then uh, went to social impact sector and then all of a sudden got a presidential appointment. So like, you know, kind of sky's, sky's the limit. Uh, and, and I, and I want to say that, you know, as someone standing on the legacy of Ethel Tremaine Robinson, the first black woman graduate of Pembroke College, you know, we celebrated 115 years of her uh, anniversary of graduating for Brown, you know, la last year. Um, and we, I IPC just did a really wonderful program with um, graduates of the 1950s and, and um, those Black women talking about their experience at, at Pembroke, um, you know, in the 50s. Um, so I, I just think that, um, you know, being able to position uh, for opportunity and be able to see it and to execute on it or monetize it is, is kind of like the skill set that's needed. Um, and I believe Brown prepares um, our women for that. Oh, well, yeah, no, I mean, and the thing I would want to just add to this is the level of flexibility of mind that I felt Brown gave me because it, it, and that, that is probably in of the labor market with 
people are going to need, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, right, the ability to sort of shape shift according to what's coming out at them. So this is one thing that uh, we're trained at as brown, brown feminists. I can say that here. I'm in a safe space. Um, all right, now I'm going to move on to some questions from the audience. And there's a lot because these are brown ladies. And I'm not sure if I'm supposed to name the people, um, but uh, am I supposed to name the people? Anybody? Um, I'll just call them by their first names. How's that? Kim asks, what does this look like outside of our usual Brunonian white collar scope, women in work, COVID, COVID impacts for blue collar women of color? Okay, I feel like we have answered that. If there's a part of this question that seems, I think, it, I think we have answered that. Um, I'm gonna just keep going here. There's a, oh, this is interesting. There's a small subset of Americans who are against paid family leave, childcare. Do you have a sense of what's driving this behavior given the societal benefits of these issues? And I was gonna ask about this sort of Overton window we have for paid leave. We're seeing it right now, you know, Joe Manchin pushing back, whatever. But who, but beyond him, like who are these people? And you see them, there was focus groups done around paid leave recently and they were, parents who didn't want me to leave. who are these people and what what is it that anger we're talking about that anger of needing anything uh feeling like they can't need anything from their society and from others around them or is it is it that uh you know they don't want other people to need anything and get anything uh what, what do you think karen um well so um i think it's probably a couple of things uh and and this is based on kind of what I learned when I was uh, actively engaged in the policy world and during in the Obama administration. And so first of all, there's a whole set of people who hate the idea of anything that's a mandate. So that's that's not the paid leave, that's program that's being proposed right now where the government would put in money. But you know, one solution to paid leave, which other countries use, which is just firms have to uh, provide paid leave. Um, so, uh, so I think it's, it's partly that, that some people just really object to things that are, um, government mandates. I also just think there are people who just don't, and this is a, a variation on that theme, who just don't like the idea of big government. I mean, we've seen, and it's not a new thing. Um, you know, we see, we saw this, um, uh, during the, you know, right after the financial crisis and, uh, you know, we were trying to push money to the hardest hit states. Not all the states used the money that was given to them. You know, and some of them were deeply, you know, they were the hardest hit ones in terms of the number of foreclosures and amount of job loss. And they weren't using this extra amount of money. And they, I, you know, I'm not sure why, but, um, you know, one hypothesis was that they just didn't kind of like this idea of, uh, kind of having, you know, a big government housing agency dispensing all this money. Uh, you know, we've seen it also uh, healthcare, uh, ACA, expansion of Medicaid, where, uh, you know, the states will receive money from the federal government to expand Medicaid and not all um, states have taken uh, the government up on that. So I do think it, it is just, you know, it, it, is, it is views about kind of role of government. Yeah, and I would add to that, it's um, who who is perceived to be needing the help receiving the benefits and who's perceived exactly. to be paying for it, right? So that gets to kind of the third rails in our society, which are probably a more, you know, social in nature than economic, right? Where we, um, like Isabel Wilkerson talks about caste um, and this idea that, you know, we're kind of... Um, when we think about social mobility or social utility, who is the benefit benefactors of that? Who are the contributors, right? If we think about this big pot, um, there's you know perceptions about who has um, disproportionately contributed or who's like kind of taking uh, from that without having contributed. Um, and so I think those are that's some of what perhaps is driving it. I um, mean, then it gets back to um, again. Uh, perhaps, you know, this rugged individualism um, that is quite, you know, violent as a society in some ways where we are meant to just, you know, go it alone off the, off the rough side of the mountain and not ask any um, additional benefits um, um, because that's kind of, you know, how uh, 
the forebears did it or whatever. Um, there's also this idea of, um, you know, kind of future generational cost. Um, and you see that kind of coming up with the debt ceiling conversations, et cetera, kind of like, what are we burdening our children with? Um, and, um, you know, there's some irony <laughs> in there about not wanting to pay for paid family leave so we can protect the kids. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but I, I, do, I do think these are, you know, uh, probably more, um, you know, social and psychological than um, rational and economic. Can, can I, I just, I, can I just yeah. say one, one more thing, which again, I'm going to go back to selling my book as an economist, but this is really why this... Um, oh, wait, this, Karen, this, Karen, what's your book? What's your book? <laughs> no, I don't have a book. I just meant <laughs> <laughs> Um I just meant, uh, you know, there's this body of research that shows that um, kind of you should think about this spending on social programs or at least some some social programs, some of the best social programs, you know, have a payoff for for everyone. That's why it's just so important. It's an investment, just like investing in infrastructure, which we everyone loves infrastructure. Uh, you know, it's an investment for the country. It's not simply about it's certainly not about providing some sort of, you know, crutch in the moment, but it's, it's not just about relieving hardship in the moment. It is, you know, it's an investment that benefits everyone, but this is why I just think, you know, just one of the really important messages to get across is that this is like evidence-based kind of benefits everyone. You know, I mean, I think a lot of it's a branding problem too. Like it's what, it's what you're saying. Like if we made, if we said, this is a you know, low risk, high yield investment, <laughs> you know, like we, we have to start using it. I thought, you know, human infrastructure was good, but there's more to this. Like we could start sort of monetizing the language we're using around some of this. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna... I, I was talking to a reporter recently and he was asking me why it's taken the conversation in Washington so long to pick up on this idea. And it, you know, I mean, we're there, you know, it's, it's there now, but I think partly it is, this research gets done by, um, we would say, microeconomists, people who study kind of poor children and their families. But it's like a, the argument itself is like what we call a macro uh, argument. Mm -hmm. It's good for everybody. But the problem is you've got within economics, we've got groups of people who don't spend enough time talking about how we can brand things together. So. Oh yeah, like let me let me help let me help. Um, but that's what I'm here, and I'm just happy we got past trickle down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, but um, I mean, I think that's part of why we have to tell these stories, and the the um, Norman Lear Center calls them hybrid narratives that are half sociological or economic and very human. And good politicians all understand this, but I mean, I think it's it's really important maybe to pair i mean just i'm just thinking structurally e economists with humanities types who can kind of uh storify their their data i i absolutely think that's right i mean there's been a you know a set of books that that ha have been coming out that have helped you know have done exactly that but without telling that human story without creating that narrative uh it all seems like pretty boring statistics you know puts you to sleep Mm -hmm. And also, I will say that, you know, if you're talking about uh, people who are experiencing hardship in this country, it's never just, you can never boil it down to a couple of numbers. It's always more complicated than that. So, so it's nice we have these kind of clean, you know, results and simple models, but you need that. Yeah. Um, so I have some, a few more questions here. One is from Amy Sohn, who I've known for many years, a writer. How would investment in the care economy change all this in Build Back Better or elsewhere? Do you want me to start? Yeah, I, I, I'll defer to the economist and I can add, okay. add in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we don't know where Build Back Better is going to um, come out, but, um, you know, certainly, I mean, exactly what's going to be in it when it finally passes, but um, there are provisions that are um, kind of quite important, and some of them are about the longer term payoff, so, you know, uh, expand, um, you know, high quality pre-K expansion, you know, that's been demonstrated to have kind of beneficial uh, effects for children through adulthood. Um, but, you know, things like um, 
more funding for childcare, um, like the money that's in um, uh, Medicaid, Medicare for um, kind of longer term care, because we, we need to remember it's not all about childcare, that um, you know, a lot of caregivers in this um, economy are actually caring for older relatives, maybe both older and, and relatives and children. Um, th those things, um, uh, you know, obviously will be, um, you know, good for families, but they will, for example, um, hopefully reduce the obstacles to, to women working and in particular women who, uh, you know, cannot afford those things, um, uh, you know, with that, without that kind of, um, support from the government. Um, yeah, and I'll, um, just you know, say uh, for the record that, I mean, you know, I'm answering this as a, um, a Brown alum as in my personal capacity and not uh, representative of the administration. Um, the Build Back Better plan and other um, kinds of, you know, uh, policy objectives um, that are currently, you know, being mulled over, um, including um, the, you know, first ever um, White House gender policy strategy, national strategy on gender equity and equality, um, that really centers again at these intersections that we talk, we've been talking about all evening, um, is a conceptual, um, you know, reshaping of how we think about caring for different members of our society, um, and uh, the kinds of long-term investments that we're making uh, to close those gaps that have been dragging down GDP, that have been creating over time. I mean, we we talked about with, you know, the pandemic, and um, even maybe you know, a decade or so ago when um, we were debating about the Affordable Care Act, you know, the kind of um, uh, cycles of, of, of poverty and despair that people get in that now need uh, additional ancillary benefits that, that keep them out of the workforce long term, that, um, you know, keep them, um, you know, um, dependent in some ways uh, on uh, social programs. And, and then that, you know, kind of, there's a drag on, on our society. And so what would it mean to pay people a living wage? What would it mean to give uh, the folks that are most, um, you know, in harm's way from some of these downstream forces, the ability to travel further away from work, knowing that their elders and their children are going to be safer um, at home because they're cared for by individuals that um, don't take up 60% of their take-home pay. Um, Right. What would it mean to uh, make sure that our children, um, as Karen mentioned, are cared for in a way throughout their life cycle so they do have better opportunity and can be contributing members to society um, and not, um, um, it, and we all know, right, it's uh, easier to, um, uh, in prison is expensive, <laughs> right, and more expensive than keeping people, um, you know, working and, and contributing to society. So, you know, I think all of these kinds of, um, uh, you know, narratives. Um, and, and by the way, right, when we think about infrastructure, human infrastructure is part of it. Um, and these kinds of rescue programs um, have been going on for the private sector for a long time, right, um, have been um, part of the uh, regeneration of the American economy for, for a long time. And so we, you know, I think it's important that where we are um, with what we know now and the data at our disposal, um, we make some different policy decisions that can really um, help influence and buttress the people that um, have been, you know, structurally helping our society along, but haven't gotten in any of the ancillary benefits over multiple generations of economic success. Great. Well said, Andrea. I have only time for one more question, and this one is Delicious. How can we get more men engaged in this issue? Yes. I often see uh, these seminars aimed at women talking about childcare and COVID and targeting, targeting us basically. And this is something that comes up a lot, right? You go to an event on parenting and the majority of the people, you know, like a like a intellectual event on parenting or reading around a, you know, a study. Um, so um do you guys have any thoughts on that? Like, how do we how do we take maybe take the stigma out or uh, do outreach to men who might actually maybe shame men into being more interested in these topics? <laughs> any thoughts? Um, well, I guess I'm kind of hopeful that this episode we will see more men engaged on this issue. Um, I remember the the first place I I looked I worked sorry the first place I worked I the it, it didn't have 
as good um, policies around uh, having kids as it could have had. But what made the difference was that suddenly when men wanted to start taking paternity leave, when they started wanting flexible schedules, that's suddenly when this became the institutional norm. And I will tell you that a lot of the data I've seen regarding um, uh, child care responsibilities and kind of compromises people um, have made with their careers over the pandemic um, have suggested that that men are also, um, I mean, I have, I, th I think it's fair to say that that women, I've seen data suggesting women have shouldered more of those responsibilities, but that there have been compromises that men have had to make too. And the data are showing that that it's not just women, it's it's men who want, you know, looking ahead um, jobs with more flexibility uh, and jobs that allow for a greater work-life balance. So I'm hoping, because I'm, I'm hopeful that that will bring more men into the conversation. Because it's called asymmetrical giving, right? Where women, seriously, women are the ones who are doing that. Um, so Andrea, any last thoughts? I guess we, we have a, a minute to spare probably, but yeah. Yeah, we need men as allies, advocates, and co-conspirators and all these gender inequity issues, um, including uh, economic recovery and uh, you know, pandemic gendered labor. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think it's the same conversation we were having about you know, raising responsible boys and making sure that they, you know, grow up with value systems that, you know, not just honor the women in their lives, but think about, you know, con the conceptual reality um, and what it means to be um, a man that is um, in support of, uh, you know, true gender equity and equality. Well, with that, uh, I am going to close out this conversation and hand it back to the great Marsha. And thank you so much, Karen and Andrea, for your eloquence and your energy. And thank you again. It's great to be here. Great questions. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, on behalf of the Pembroke Center and on behalf of everybody that has listened to this last very speedy hour, thank you. Thank you for for clarifying and complicating the issue, um, which is so brown, right? Um, and, and also for not only helping us understand what's going on, but also explore how we can affect change. Um, thank you, it was, it was a, a magnificent conversation. I also wanna express gratitude to the Pembroke Center Advisory Council and especially to the program committee and my co-chair Ryan Grubbs for making this event possible. And finally, our thanks go out to the Brown Women's Network for their co-sponsorship and collaboration. Um, and thank all of you for coming tonight. I hope that in the new year, you will keep a lookout for more events as we continue to celebrate 130 years of women at Brown and the 40th anniversary of the Pembroke Center. Again, Alyssa, Karen, Andrea, thank you so much. It was a marvelous conversation. Everyone have a great night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ever true. <laughs>